Thanks, Benji. Welcome, everybody. We're really excited to talk about pheasant hunting. Uh, the big opener is this weekend in uh, Minnesota for pheasant hunting. And we're fortunate to have with us one of our researchers from the DNR, uh, Tim Lyons, who works uh, with Farmland Wildlife Research. And uh, we'll be going over some great information about pheasants and pheasant management. And, and we can talk a little bit about how that pertains to hunting and how that might help us this weekend. So, Tim, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks for being here. I think you're muted. There we go. Now I'm back to unmuted. All How right. about that? All right. Gets so, yeah. Every time. Uh, yep. So, like uh, Jeff said, I'm Tim Lyons. I'm part of, you know, the DNR. I do research, but uh, sort of just to, you know, today we're going to talk about some of the research and management uh, work that we do and how that might, you know, Jeff said, might pertain to hunting. Kind of just real quick as background, um, I'm part of the Farmland Wildlife and Populations Research Group. Uh, we're a group based out of Adelia, Minnesota. There's some deer folks, uh, and then there's an upland gang side, and that's where I work. Uh, primarily, we're doing research on pheasants and turkeys. Um, but folks you might be most familiar with um, our August roadside survey, which is what we coordinate every year. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're the ones producing that report and producing uh, the map you see that goes out there on the right. So, thanks. Um, Sort of, I want to talk sort of talk about today uh, is some of the recent research here in Minnesota and a few other places uh, that can sort of shed some light on uh, sort of what the logic behind some of our management is, as well as sort of potentially help you all with your hunting. You know, uh, the map here on the right is uh, pretty crude. Um, it, you know, I don't know if folks don't like to read the fine print, but uh, if you do read it, you know, it's, it's you tell the folks. There are good areas in the bad air, bad colors and some bad areas in the good colors. And so um, kind of what we're going to talk about today is some of that basic background that's going to help maybe answer some of these questions, you know, uh, improve your hunting success. So like where are there going to be the most birds, how their behavior comes into play, and sort of what these implications are for hunting. So just kind of as a precursor, folks already mentioned it. Um, our pheasant opener is starting this Saturday. Uh, it runs season runs through January 1st. The shooting hours start at 9 a.m. and you go until sunset. Um, and our bag limit for how many birds you can have, you can shoot each day, are two roosters per day through December 1st. And then after that, we bump it up to three birds per day. And the possession limits on how many birds you can have between your person and back in your freezer. That's double the bag limit typically. So. If you need any more additional information, the DNR has a website about pheasant hunting. So uh, you can see that kind of screenshot there on the right. Um, I think uh, Benji's going to put that in the chat too if you need it. Need it. So, um, kind of so, you know, real, some brief background about pheasants and pheasant hunting in the state. Um, we, about the, on the hunting side of things, we generally restrict our harvest to roosters only. Um, this is mostly because the pheasants, you can see on the bottom left there, those are roosters. Bottom left is a rooster, right is a hen. Uh, they're pretty different looking. Uh, birds, these birds have a, what they call a polygence mating system. So one male can breed with a lot of females. So typically there's a lot of male birds running around at the end of the, at the end of the summer who are not going to contribute much to the next population. Um, sometimes get referred to as a non-breeding surplus. So that's why we've, we are allowed to hunt them, and we don't really have the same sort of restrictions you see, uh, like you might see on turkeys uh, or deer, in terms of you know we limit how many how many can be removed, things like that. Um, you know, it's just two birds per day, and there is no like season cap at all. Um, some kind of brief history about pheasants in the state. We tried releasing some back in 1905, that didn't work, um, and then there was a state-run game farm that started in about 1916 and 17. Uh, you know, giving out eggs and things and birds to, for different farmers and throughout the state to release. They had their first hunting season in 1924, so we've almost come up to 100 years of pheasant hunting in the state. Um, um, and yeah, uh, since then it's sort of really taken off, um, and we've been off to the races since then. Um, so when we're talking about uh, the birds and what, what to find them, as I mentioned. We have this, you know, you know, surplus non-breeders. Um, we don't really do a whole lot of harvest management, like I said, like the way you do with turkeys or deer, in terms of restricting how many can be removed each year. 
So when we start thinking about our population and what drives that sort of hunting opportunity, um, it's really having an understanding of that basic population um, biology is, you know, pretty useful. So for pheasants, when we typically think about that, um, we're typically interested in things like nesting success, tick survival, and then uh, to some extent, hen survival over winter. Uh, those are the three big drivers of, you know, whether or not you're going to have birds, their local population size and that local density. And in particular, it's nesting success and this chick survival that overwhelmingly drive, um, you know, the number of available birds. So we tend to focus on that a lot. And so sort of backing up for a second here, you know, when you when you talk about where you want to find birds, um, the big one is treeless areas. Um, this is some work out of Nebraska, but just showing that, um, you know, when you start thinking about it at really broad spatial scales, you typically don't see as many pheasants in more forested areas. Not that they don't exist there, but you start thinking about it as you go further north, um, there's more trees. Uh, potentially, it's because there's less agriculture, but also potentially more potential, more potential predators as well. Um, you know, pheasants have been long tied to agriculture, even going back to, you know, the time of uh, the Mongols, actually. Uh, there's accounts about that, about you know, agriculture and game birds that even as far back as then. So um, when you're starting to think about where to where to pheasant hunt or where within that map we have of our roadside densities, um, a big driver is um, tree cover. So avoiding tree cover, you know, and we see that typically in how we select wildlife management areas for pheasants in the state. Uh, the other aspect of that is finding large grasslands uh, or large complexes of grasslands. Um, one of the things, you know, we talk about nest success being very important. Uh, one of the biggest drivers of nest success is the amount of grassland around. Um, this is a pattern that's repeatable, you know, through time and space. You know, this is some of my research been back in Illinois showing that the probability a nest actually gets to hatching before it's, you know, gets to hatch is, you know, directly linear increasing with the amount of grassland surrounding it. Um, you know, this was back in the mid 20 teens. Um, it's the same pattern from Iowa back in the 90s. Um, you can see, sort of see the same thing here. These lighter colors are where nest success is going to be higher. Darker colors was where it's lower. So you know, you have these blocks, bigger blocks of habitat or areas where that habitat's more grouped closer together. Uh, that's where you're going to find higher nest success. So it's kind of like that first level of, you know, if you want to find birds to hunt, that's where you go. Um, treeless areas, areas with either large blocks of grassland or um, just a lot of it around. Um, I kind of just like to point out on that previous slide too, it doesn't take a whole lot. Um, if you think about 10% of a three kilometer radius of a site, that's maybe, you're talking about maybe, you know, 40 acres of grassland for every section. Um, that's about that ratio, what that ratio is. So 40 out of every 640 acres of grassland, and then you're up to, that's 10%, you're up to 50% nest survival there, which is really good actually. Um, so. Again, it doesn't need to be a huge complex, um, but you do still need to have a fair bit around. Um, another thing to consider is, you know, it's not just this landscape pattern um, or, you know, how much grass in the landscape. Um, that's been kind of a driving paradigm, if you will, in conservation, particularly for pheasants for a very long time. Um, but what we're starting to find out more too is that it can also be um, what's inside those areas. So, you know, whether it's, some sort of high diversity planting, like you see there on the left, some more tall natives um, on, this, on this diagonal, or like even some, you know, see a pheasant nest here and some brome and whatnot. Um, but this turns out that this is also pretty important um, for driving that local abundance you might find in terms of finding birds. Um, kind of just as a case in point, um, apologize for the colors, just trying to show as much contrast as possible. Um, some work we did in Illinois, or I personally did in Illinois a few years back. Um, in terms of where birds are choosing to nest, uh, you can sort of see on the left here, we have sort of a map of the different cover types in the site, and then on the right, uh, where these birds are. Um, and sort of just sort of pointing out here, this bright green color um, that's here on the map, you know, to here to some extent as well, and some of these alternating strips. Um, it's not a whole lot of birds there. Um, that's what this sort of looks like. It's not that it's not used as nesting habitat, it's just that there, there aren't as many. Um, 
and compare that to something like uh, these darker colors, this you know blue or this pink color. These are mixed grasses or grasses that have, even if even if they're grown, they have some sort of forb component to it. Um, that's kind of what these areas look like. You know, in the summertime when they're growing, they might be really diverse like this, or you know, as the season progresses, you know, get to fall, they tend to look like these you know stands of grass. Um, that's overwhelmingly what pheasants are choosing for their nest sites when it's when they when they do have a choice. Um, and I was another example. Uh, this is some work from uh, here in Minnesota, showing what pheasants are choosing for their nest sites. You know, this is the dominant vegetation, so you think the most common thing. So it's not you know, so so they're not necessarily selecting against forbs, but they're just selecting it against. Let me back up. Uh, on this graph, it's showing what birds select for and against. Anything above this dotted line is things they're choosing, and on the bottom below it is things they're generally avoiding. So the way to interpret it is not that they're avoiding forbs or grasses; it's just that they're not they're avoiding areas where it's almost all forbs or almost all grasses. Uh, so, um, and we start to think about where they're choosing. It's, it's native and forb grasses are what's key to that nest site selection. They, whether or not they influence success or the you know the probability that the nest gets to hatching, um, it's not as strong. It's not as obvious. Um, but what we do know is that these nests that are initiated in these grass and forb mixes, um, they tend to nest earlier there, sometimes by several weeks, compared to birds that are going to nest in brome. And the population level benefit to that is, if you have birds nesting earlier, they have more chance to make to produce a second nest if that first one should fail. Um, so again, that's just adding to the, having more birds in the landscape. And sort of why that nest and forb complex and why in here you see the sort of standing dead um, is so important is that's what this looks like. So this is in the winter or you know, coming out of winter. Um, you can sort of see there's a lot of standing dead stuff, but it tends to be lodged over. Well, that might not be great habitat. Um, you know, it turns out that actually under these little these lodged areas, that's where birds like to make their nests. And, you know, another example would be something like this. Late fall, it's a lot of standing dead like this. This is what they're picking. Um, you know, you get this mostly with again native grasses and forbs, and not so much with brome. Um, so that's sort of why you sort of see that pattern. You know, at least that's what we think. Sort of moving on to that other part about chick survival. Um, you know, that's important. That's the other important part of having birds in the fall is how many birds you can produce throughout that summer. Um, this one's kind of harder to nail down in terms of what, in terms of you know, where in a landscape you might find them more, where you're going to see more chicks running around. Um, part of it is because there's a lot of things that affect chick survival, um, namely precipitation. We know that, you know, in that first seven day period here, um, survival drops precipitously the more rain there is. So, excuse me. Um, that can be really hard. That tends to swamp a lot of habitat related effects. Um, but some of the things we do think about um, in terms of what might give birds a chance, provided they don't die from rain or precipitation or things like that, um, it is, is good habitat. And what comprises good habitat or how can we measure that? Um, one of the things is this, this idea of really good foraging habitat. You know, in this case, um, maybe you've heard it from pheasants forever. But again, it's that same idea of native grasses and a lot, a lot of forb diversity. Um, typically, that's where you find more insects. I um, may have heard things about having being able to roll a golf ball or a tennis ball underneath, um, so having a lot of bare dirt. Um, you know, some of the sort of, some of the sort of where that sort of comes from is, you know, in this case, this was a study where they, you know, it was pretty cool. They had chicks that were imprinted on people, so they could turn them loose out into different areas of a field or different types of, you know, CRP plantings, let them run around, come back, they can see what they ate. And overwhelmingly, you know, in terms of this axis right here, that's how much, how much insect biomass these birds consumed. And if you look at across all these different uh, plantings, the CP10 and the CP25, these were the diverse. They had either had you know exotic grasses with some forbs interseed like alfalfa, or in this case, this was a lot of native forbs like sunflowers, um, purple prairie clover, things like that. Um, so when we're starting to think about like what's going to give chicks the best chance, you know, again, we don't always measure it terribly well because of other things like rain. Um, but it is there are habitat things we can do that we think are going to give birds a, a good chance at at surviving. 
Um, when we start thinking about habitat use, one of the things we are really kind of considering is um, bare dirt, form cover, and overhead concealment. You know, that's going to some of our, our data and our research, what that sort of shows. Um, how do you maintain that? Um, the answer is through some kind of disturbance. So uh, some of our wildlife management areas, folks might see them burning it, or we'll have grazing, or we'll have um, pain going on. And that's all part of a way to um, not just maintain the plant biodiversity for other critters, but it's also beneficial for pheasants because, again, their habitat use is being really driven by this bare dirt, orb cover, and that overhead concealment. Um, so when it starts, you know, kind of just kind of wrapping this up and bringing it together, where you're going to find birds on a landscape, where should you be looking within that map? Um, typically, brome, fescue, or other cool exotic dominated areas that are a lot of trees around or they don't have it, haven't been disturbed in a very long time. Those are areas that are, again, they're not going to not have birds. So there's not going to be as many. Um, and areas we're going to try to choose, choose out uh, where you should go is these more diverse forb or grass mixes. There's more data, more native species, and they've been periodically disturbed, whether it's haying, fire, or grazing. Um, a lot of our uh, state lands or wildlife management areas have that. Um, but it's also important, I think, too, I think uh, they just put up that link for a lot of our walk and access areas are also like this as well. So where folks can go hunt, um, that's typically where you're going to find the most birds. Again, not you can't find birds elsewhere. So I know folks are going to tell me that, you know, they hunt a, a filter strip and they always see birds there. And that's true. They're, they're going to be there, too. But, you know, this is more of an on average um, sort of thing. So on average, you will find more birds in these sorts of areas. So sort of once you get out there, um, you know, the question is, you know, you figured out where you want to go sort of in the landscape, what fields you want to hunt. So once you're out there, where are the pheasants going to be? Um, I think this is a good chance to start to think about some other factors, uh, maybe um, what, what, you know, what are the behaviors that are, what's driving their behavior in terms of where they're going to be? Um, that sort of comes down to food, predation, and thermoregulation, um, whether it's being hot or too, too hot or too cold. Um, you know, trying to, they're just, they're out there, they're trying to meet these needs and it's not sort of a black and white thing. This is what's driving their behavior. There's, there could be a lot of trade-offs and overlap among these things. So, um, bring this up again, this is our map. This was actually some brood locations, uh, we had, um, for our birds, but I sort of just want to show this again, because it's that same map. It's that same, you know, birds are in our 4B areas. They're avoiding these really Rome dominated, you know, no forbed areas. Um, they're even moving into cover to standing crops sometimes. Um, and sort of the take home from, you know, this work is that, you know, our adult habitat use does mirror this brooding habitat use and this, um, and our nesting habitat use. They're overall preferring these diverse mixes of grasses and forbs. Um, and sort of as another note, when you start to think about um, throughout the season, at least back in Illinois, as there as the season progresses, they're tending to use more uh, of our dense grass stands. So, um, kind of as a sample, you know, when you think about going out there early season, like maybe this weekend, again, you know, we think that they're mostly selecting for overhead cover. So sometimes uh, it might look like this, or you know, before snows fall, uh, it could look like you know more dead, but again, taller stuff. Um, it can be tricky in the early season, especially if there's standing crops nearby. Birds love to go run into standing crops, particularly corn. Um, again, we think they're selecting for that overhead cover and that concealment, um, but they do hang out on fields as well. So finding that um, is a good chance if, there, if some of you come out of a field where there's a lot of different potential plant species compositions. Um, as the season progresses, you know, um, it's what a lot of our tall grasses tend to start to look like. Uh, we know birds will go out there and roost for certain, uh, but during the daytime, they're probably going to be moving into things like standing cattails. Again, they're selecting for that overhead cover. So, you know, early in the season, you might want to be hitting up some of these uh, dense grass stands, but as the season progresses and they fill in with snow, um, our wetlands will freeze over. You might be able to access them and, you know, see some birds in these cattails as well. Excuse 
Um, what else? About it. Um, then you know, once, you, once you're out there, um, considering how to increase some success, um, there isn't a whole lot of information on this. Um, some of you folks might have a better sense of that than I already. Um, but what I did, we have worked with folks who actually tried to address this specifically. You know, they did things where we had you know, microphones out there to determine when hunters were shooting. Um, we could you know, actually spatially locate that through a set of microphones that were deployed out in the field. Uh, we had folks filling out state surveys about their hunt. And then we also used uh, GPS trackers given to hunters to track where they were walking in these fields. So um, you're talking about once you're out there in the field, you know, we sort of know some of that habitat where the birds might be more likely, but what else can you do to increase that success? Um, the answer is don't avoid uh, areas. I guess the simple answer is hunt where the birds are actually going to be. Um, this is an example of one of our study sites from back in Illinois. Um, these yellow dots or pins are where hunters wandered. You can see a big old blank spot uh, of hunters in here throughout the season. That's because it looked like this. Um, it's it is that you know this grass was I'm six foot two and it's taller than me. Um, it's a beast to walk through. It's certainly harder, uh, especially you know if dogs to get there through there too. But that tends to be where the birds are hanging out. So. Um, you know, don't overlook those sorts of areas just because they're more difficult to get through. Um, they can still pay, I would say, pay, pay dividends in terms of seeing birds. Um, one thing else to maybe focus on too is think about as an activity. Uh, a lot of times we sort of think about going out hunting, getting out there early, getting birds off that roost. Um, that's certainly one way to do it. One thing that some of this work also showed though was that you're more likely to bump into a bird is once it's up and moving as opposed to when it's maybe sitting on a roost. You know, it's a lot harder in a field to find that single point versus if you know you and that pheasant are meandering around. And so what you're kind of looking at here is some graphs of pheasant activity throughout the day um, in November and December. So you can sort of see they're you know sedentary overnight. Um, and as the day you know, progresses, you have this bump kind of mid early morning, um, they're getting off that roost. Kind of, and then it kind of builds throughout the afternoon and there's maybe a, you know, peak towards sunset and then it drops again for the night. Um, you know, in December, maybe that's a little more pronounced that mid morning and that late, late evening or, you know, you know, pre evening time period for when birds are going to be foraging. You know, they're coming off the roost, they need to get food. They're going to get food before they go back on the roost. So again, um, it's certainly well worthwhile to continue hunting throughout the afternoon. Um, there's still great chances to run into birds that way. Uh, another thing uh, is hunting weather. Um, again, it's probably um, a lot of folks might already know this if you're you know, experienced in hunting, um, but hunting success you know tends to drop when there's things like more wind, or and also we found out when it's raining. Um, it's basically because not just because it's really hard to shoot a bird when it's flying past you at 40 miles an hour with the wind behind it. Um, birds just aren't also as active. So again, that whole idea that you know we know that you're more likely to run into a bird if if it's also moving around. Um, you know that tends to decline. Again, it's not like it's impossible. You know this decline isn't huge, um, but there is an effect. So it's something to consider. Um, other thing is your party characteristics. This maybe is the easiest thing for you to control. Um, the biggest one is having more people out there. Um, don't be like me and go around by yourself uh, and just wander around for a couple hours and not see anything. Go out there with people. Again, you're more likely to bump into birds. You're more likely to kick. You're going to kick them up, uh, which equates with the chance to harvest one. And the other thing is hunting with a dog. Um, that's a big one. You know, obviously not not everyone has that opportunity, but if you can partner up with someone who does or Tag along in a group. Uh, that's another really great way to improve your odds of success. Or maybe it's just a good excuse for you to go buy a dog now or adopt one. Um, another thing to consider too is your effort. Um, one of the things, and some of the, again, some of that research from Illinois came up with was if you were familiar with a site, um, you know, you're more likely to be able to hunt for, you know, harvest birds. And I think that's just mostly because if you're there a bunch, you're going to eventually run into birds. You're going to know where they tend to hang out. Um, so you're going to hunt those areas more. Um, so, you know, a lot of folks might tend to want to go to the Southwest to hunt and that's great. There's lots of great opportunity in the Southwest part of the state, but maybe picking some place closer to home where you're going to get out more, you're going to get a chance to learn those sites better. 
Um, that's maybe another strategy to employ here. And then the other thing is just the amount of time you're going to spend hunting while you're out there. Um, I think, you know, it's probably really simple. The more time you're out there, the more chances you have to shoot a bird. So, um, you know, I, I grew up where I'm from, you know, it's pretty common for folks to around lunchtime, maybe knock off hunting and that's it for the day. But the more you're, the more you're out there, the more you're going to see a bird. So, um, you know, just keep at it. I think that's the biggest simple thing. Um, now I kind of, you know, I kind of breeze through a lot of these things. Um, I don't have a whole lot more to talk about. I figure, figure it might be better than for folks if they have questions to sort of ask them um, and maybe you can go from there. Yeah, thank you, Tim. And there's your contact information in case people had specific research questions, they can reach out to you, right? Yep. Uh, really good background information kind of on, on the bird and what we can expect and where we see, but I, I want this, and, and, and as you just mentioned, we would love to have some questions. We have some time here, so please use the Q&A and throw a question up there. And we did have one up there just clarifying the uh, possession limit. Um, I can't remember exactly how you worded it on your slide, but they um, we looked it up and it is three times the daily limit. Oh, three so times. Early, early in the season, it's six birds, and later in the season when it switches to the three day or three per day, it's a nine possession limit. So Oops. thanks for the clarification, Sorry. Brian. No problem. Uh, we have a question that came in: Is what can I do as an individual to help improve public land habitat? Gosh. Um... I, mean, I think buying licenses is the big one. Um, you know, well, Minnesota is unique in that, um, you know, most states, including Minnesota, a lot of our funding comes from license sales and from stamp sales, you know, the pheasant stamp, even if folks aren't hunting, um, it's a great funding source. It's dedicated funding source for things like Habitat. But, you know, supporting programs, you know, again, I'm, from, I'm not originally from Minnesota, but coming here, no, you guys have this LCCMR program, you have the Environmental Natural Resource Trust Fund, you know, Correct, which is a lottery, lottery money. Yeah, those are you know funding sources that a lot of places, other places don't have. Um, and if you look at it, that really does help. You know, the Outdoor Heritage Fund, you know, which is funded through some of those things, I know. Um, that's a yeah, great way to, to, go ahead, Jeff. You yeah, might have Arlen, better Arlen asked that. that question, and if you don't already have a habitat plate, we, are, we have this great opportunity in Minnesota to purchase an annual, a plate that's designated um, for habitat. and the money that count is collected annually, I believe it's thirty dollars right now per year. You pay extra for that 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 license plate on your car. That money goes pretty directly, I believe, for habitat in Minnesota. So that's another great option. Plus, you know, shows other people how important this is. But if you're a landowner, there are some options too, right? I know there's partnerships with other organizations in the DNR. It works a lot with some of the land acquisition in certain parts of the state. We're looking, or always looking to get good quality habitat. So that's. That's a, a one way to help support that. And I'll mention one more thing, and maybe Benji, if you can look up the Conservation Partners Legacy Grants. We have a pretty large grant program that helps support um, efforts to improve and maintain habitat on some, and including uh, public lands. So that would be, I believe there's an open grant round right now. So if you're part of an organization that wants to help support uh, habitat on public lands, that's a great option too. And I think he had a follow up question that uh, are there options to put in time to help with that? That would be a good example of where that would be an option. And then uh, what about some of our, we have area wildlife offices. Is there ever projects is, projects are that um, area wildlife managers are looking at for like volunteers or anything? Um, you know, I think it probably varies a lot by area. I think. Um, better opportunity, a better easier way to streamline that would be working with some of the local like Pheasant Forever chapters. I know mm -hmm. kind of by me recently there were a Pheasants Forever chapter. They did some fence removal at one of the uh, I don't know I can't remember if it was a state habitat area or if it was a federal WPA, but um, you know they're they're gonna be the ones that are be more organized in um, putting those sorts of things together. So looking for your local except looking for your local um, Pheasants Forever chapter or another sort of one of those types of groups. They're going to be more plugged into that. Yeah, probably absolutely. more able to coordinate that. And a, another link for you, Benji. Um, we're in the process. I think I think it's live, but I'm, I was uh, going to be going live. We are helping 
um, to encourage folks to sign up for Pheasants Forever's um, mentor program to encourage people to participate in taking someone else. So it's not directly habitat, but the more people we can ex get excited about pheasants and pheasant hunting and habitat, you know, hopefully more people will get engaged in helping support sport um, habitat and pheasants. So check out that option too. Again, Pheasants Forever does a lot of great stuff and is in, it has this with prizes and everything. If you, um, they're giving away some things, if you sign up to be a mentor and take someone out hunting, you can get um, potentially get a prize and, and again, help grow the sport and get grow interest. Let's see. I want to go back if you oh, you just you stopped doing your slides, but you had a really great great slide in there about um, bird activity and if I thought maybe it'd be good to talk a little bit more about the daily movements and kind of what we know about you talked about pheasants roosting. Can you say a little more about I mean I've seen roost birds roost in trees. there aren't always trees available what what where exactly do you mean by roosting or where are they at? what are they doing? Yeah, so it can vary a lot, um, you know, from areas to areas. Um, so, like I said, I think I've seen birds in trees too. But typically, what we find is, you know, it depends on when when you're out there, right? So, you know, most of our hunting seasons, it's going to be cold. Um, they're going to spend overnight in thicker, denser grass. Um, we assume, we think it's because it's a, there's a thermoregulation. Uh, thing there, you know, the denser grass around them, it's easier to keep themselves warm. Insulates um, you know, kind of. There's insulates them that's less wind. Um, you know, that's where they're going to hang out. Um, but typically, maybe, you know, depending on the time of the year, uh, you know, when they start to fill in with snow, I think I had that one picture up of showing a lot of lodged over tall grasses. And they're not going to spend their time there during the day. Um, you know, some of the stuff we did in Illinois, we had really heavy snowfalls, like foot, foot deep snow. and you know, pretty much like clockwork, we're finding birds. They'll spend the night overnight period on the on these habit grassland areas with no trees around. But then sun up comes and they're moving into these uh, fence rows where there's that overhead cover from trees. You know, um, you know, there's at least more of it. So that's how we're thinking about where they're moving to and what they're sort of maybe selecting for throughout the day. So they, you know, they they roost and then they get out and they, the first thing is usually do a uh, breakfast feeding, I guess. Yeah, um, get out. Yeah, so uh, particularly at the colder it gets, I think on that uh, one slide, they showed like particularly that sort of spike increases later in the year in December when it's colder. Um, you know, the one caveat I would say to that is if it's really cold out and it's really snowy, birds will actually sit tight and they will they will just not move for potentially even for more than 24 hours. Or we do typically start seeing them get off um, the roost and feed when it's like, especially when it's sunny out, they're going to, they, they tend to bask and they're going to find areas where they can sort of be in the sun, keep themselves warm while they forage as well. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, that first first period in the morning, they're maybe a little more active. Um, and then again, right before they go back to roost at night, they're going to be out there foraging more. Um, it's maybe the, the deeper biology explanation for that is it's that trade off of they're out there foraging, they're at risk for predators, but if they don't eat, they're going to starve. So they're trying to pick and choose their times like, you know, they've come off the, you know, throughout the night, they've, they're burning calories, trying to stay warm. They got to eat something. Um, and then same thing goes throughout the day. You know, they're, they may be high, avoid that predation risk. Um, and then right before they go back on their sit night, you know, they want to bulk up a little bit before, you know, they, they deplete their energy resources overnight, keep them warm. So that's sort of why you see that sort of pattern. Um, pheasants have a crop, right? Uh, and gizzards, so they do need right is that correct so they yep. need some um small gravel or that type of thing in their diet too right correct yeah so uh, yeah see them along people. roadways and stuff at some points also right yeah so that's kind of what we're counting on when we see birds in our august roadside count um but i bet there's folks out there they'll see um particularly when there's again deep snow uh birds out on the side of the roads where the plows have come through maybe on the shoulder they're picking at the gravel so see tim i got a couple questions in the chat if you don't mind me button in i did give you the sharepoint yeah. back so if you wanted to share a couple of your slides you're more welcome oh. to do that sure. uh, gene was asking what's the difference between brome grass and forbs 
Yeah, so brome grass uh, is it's an exotic, cool season grass. Um, you probably it's what you see more on most of the highways there. Um, it's it's cool season because you know you'll see it green up really early in the springtime, but then midsummer it turns brown, and it might green up a little bit again before the fall. So that sort of cooler, wetter period. Um, it forms pretty dense monocultures, so that's a lot of times that's the only thing growing in there. Um, we talk about forbs, that's flowering plants. So like the flowers behind me. Um, technically, some folks would consider things like alfalfa a forb. Um, and when we, when it relates to pheasants, it's mostly because a lot of these plants, they're better habitat for things like insects. So there's that food resource for chicks. Um, but again, during like the hunting season or later on, um, a lot of these plants have really pithy stems, you know, like sunflowers or goldenrod even. Um, and they help to keep that grass from completely flattening out. Um, you know, we found like that one picture earlier. Um, I'll pull it up here. So brome grass was planted across the countryside, you know, when some of these uh, native prairies were removed and stuff and farmland because it grows easily, right? And it's good, it, I mean, it must be good for um, grazing too, I'm guessing. Yeah, no, yeah, that's, it's because, yeah, it greens up early, it produces a, fair, it produces a lot of biomass, it can. Okay. And um, yeah, you can be grazed pretty heavily too, or, you know, hayed. And brome alfalfa is the dominant pasture um, plant combination out there. The other grass that's been planted uh, as, as things have changed in our, on our landscapes is, is reed canary grass, which, you know, is very tolerant for wet soils. And I think folks planted it because, again, it grows easily and it can be hayed. Uh, well, I don't yeah. think it's the greatest hay, but it can tolerate the wet locations. And so we still see it because we have wetlands uh, throughout the state. But that's not necessarily, I mean, there's certain times I think it's use, useful for pheasants, but it's not, it's not, definitely not a real great um, no. plant for pheasants, right? Yeah, and again, then, it's some of that diversity. It's the structural components of it. Like when you start out like reed canary grass, if it's really hard to walk through for you, it's also probably hard to move through for the pheasants, especially little chicks. Um, so again, it's, yeah, it's great for overhead cover, maybe middle of the winter, but any other time of the year, it's not great. So, um, yeah. And then and there's some, you are saying it forms huge monocultures, but it also does not stand up well to snow. Um, yeah. so it, uh, can collapse and then it's not good for any kind of cover or anything. So compared to the plants you were talking about, they have the more rigid structure that can stand up better to snow and stuff. Yeah. And I think too, by and large, uh, you know, we're talking all about like what's good winter cover. Um, as a, you know, as from a, the biology and the ecology, like the whole life cycle part of pheasant view, it's it's useful maybe for finding birds to hunt, um, but it's not something that I would say we really need to worry about um, in terms of overwinter survival. You know, we talk about again, it's it's that nest success and the chick survival during the breeding season. That's what's really driving our bird numbers. It's not overwinter survival. Um, we don't really need, if we, if we have good chick survival and good nest success, not great, but good, the effect of that adult survival is really negligible on the overall population growth. So um, don't, don't, don't get any ideas out there about going out and, you know, planting a bunch of exotic plants or something like that for winter cover. <laughs> uh, that's a good segue um, about nesting success. Uh, Jeff asks, can you talk a little bit about breeding and how many hatches a hen might have in a season? It's always odd to see check chicks in late summer. Is this because of a second brood? So second brood, probably not. Um, you know, hens will typically stay with their uh, brood probably about a good month or more. Um, you know, less and more, the chicks will stay further and further from mom as the season goes on. So they're not going to really be able to pull up two, two hatches all the way to the broods fledging. Um, but in terms of re-nesting opportunities, yeah, birds, they're pretty prolific. Um, it's not something we know a whole lot about. Um, when I was in Illinois, we had 100% uh, any hen who lost their first nest, 100% of them would try a second nest. Um, we had nests, birds trying up to four nests in a breeding season. They all kept failing for different reasons. Um, you know, I think here in Minnesota, some of that work from five or six years ago, they were finding maybe it's closer to 75%. And way back in the 90s in Iowa, it was like 30%. So we don't really know what's effect, what's driving that, why they're re-nesting or not. Um, 
but what you're, when you're seeing late brews, it's probably, I'd say almost certainly, just hence you'll keep failing. Um, and then they're just gonna keep reinitiating nests as long as they're physically able to. They have good food available to them. They're, and there's habitat for nesting in. They're gonna keep trying generally. Um, the one maybe caveat to that is like mm -hmm. if, a, if a hen hatches her nest and then the brood get, dies right away, um, we have seen, I have seen birds will re-nest after that. Typically once they hatch though, they're not gonna try another nesting attempt. It's possible, but it's really rare. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, so there could be any number of reasons that nests could be destroyed. It, it could be human, inter, you know, agricultural practices, but um, the predators, you know, let's talk a little bit about predation and, you know, who are the predator, egg predators? And then, um, and then I think we talked a little, I don't know if you haven't, have, didn't really talk about it in the talk yet about some of the adult predators. Yeah, so um, nest predators, um, it's what folks typically think it's raccoons, skunks, foxes, um, not coyotes as much. Um, again, maybe we don't know as much about it as we do maybe songbirds because there's been a lot of studies that put little cameras out on songbird nests to see who's coming to the nests. Um, but by and large, it's yeah, it's these what people typically think of as the predators. Um, you know, that's probably why we do see that whole uh, field size effect of the amount of grassland in an area. Um, it's maybe not what people think always all the time. Will, there's a lot of talk folks might be familiar with the, the term or the concept of an edge effect. You know, if there's more, if you're if like a nest is closer to that grassland and farmland uh, border, you know, there's more chance of maybe a raccoon or a skunk moving into it. That's maybe not as true. Um, you know, whether or not that's true, it's, you know, it might be sometimes, might sometimes not be. One of the kind of really cool thing that they found is that coyotes actually will displace a lot of those other critters. So um, there's some work with ducks in particular too, because ducks and pheasants show those same sort of nesting success patterns. And they're vulnerable to the same group of predators too. Um, coyotes will bump foxes out, will bump a lot of these other predators out, and you actually see nesting success, nesting success increase then. So. Yeah, that's always interesting, that, that whole inner dynamics between the prey and the predators, but between the predators too, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. You mentioned when we were talking yesterday that um, when it comes to adult birds though, or maybe, and there's probably some avian predators on eggs too, but there were, uh, bird um, raptors were a significant, or, or could be a significant predator. Yeah, um, I'm gonna pull up some of that stuff um, here if I can. Um, and this connects with some of the tree stuff and tree research, yeah, right? Yeah, so at least that, that's kind of where we're going. So we did this in Illinois. We had telemetry towers that could automatically detect these birds every couple of minutes. And that's kind of what some of that activity information looks like. So we're actually able to pinpoint when birds were dying. And sort of what you're looking at here is a bird on a single day. Um, it's a mess, but the kind of the point, the, the thing to take note of, I guess I would say is, um, my little pointer here. Um, you can see sort of like early morning, you see this sort of like almost like a flat line. The birds aren't active as they become active throughout the day. It's this big blurry bunch and then it gets flatlined again. Um, we can see that when birds are starting to die. So this bird, you know, same time period, it's a little less active in the morning. It gets, it does get active and then it sort of drops off again. And so we know this bird, you can sort of pinpoint the time of day when this bird is dying. And sort of what we sort what we found is that most of our birds are actually dying, not at night when people would think like when we're thinking about maybe coyotes getting birds either on the nest or on the roost, um, they're getting killed well after sunrise, um, you know, even into dusk. And what we sort of found out with that is kind of see what the predators were on some of our sites and some of our other research is that it's probably avian predators. So things like hawks, um, you know, other, again, so that's why, you know, really averse to recommending tree lines and you know skeleton shelter belts first you know when they especially when they get bigger because those are roosts for things like red tails um i don't know if you guys up here you get rough rough, rough legged hawks um mm -hmm. they'll they like they tend to like the same things pheasants do in terms of big open grasslands for you know hunting on and actually some of our patterns for um hen survival kind of bore that out now, this was our hen survival over time or under different habitat conditions so 
kind of you know percent of native with, you know, within a site or within the immediate location of a bird. Um, kind of you expect an aerial raptor as there's more not that non-native or that native grass that taller stuff. Um, there's more of it. Bird those those hawks are not able to as effectively hunt in it. Um, you know, folks, if you're out there, you might see like you know harriers hanging out. They like the short stuff. They'll go hunt in a brome field. But a lot of our these bigger hawks that are probably capable of killing a pheasant, um, they're not going to be able to dive in through that thicker, taller, denser stuff. So, yeah, um, it's definitely not something you know the narrative that we always, we've always heard. Um, maybe that's due to historically not having a whole lot of raptors around, as things like DDT. But certainly in contemporary, like right now, that's a big. Um, I would say it seems to be the majority cause of our, you know, overwinter mortality. Um, and it sort of it seems to also jive with what we sort of see pheasants doing. Like I said, you know, they might roost on a grassland in the wintertime, but the minute the sun comes up, they are moving into something with that overhead cover. Um, that's going to probably protect them from raptors. So. so well, can... since I brought up predators, let, let's uh, address the issue of predator control. Um, I know that there's a lot of research on that and um, I'll, I'll let you answer that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the, it's tricky. So there's, in theory, it, I'm trying to think of the way to say this, because there is evidence for that it, it can work under certain circumstances. But I think when folks think about using predator control to boost overall numbers, it's a losing proposition. Um, first off, it's really hard. So most of the research we have, on it has done a few things. Um, it's not necessarily always effective at increasing abundance. Um, you know, it's really hard to remove all those predators. Um, in some cases, like with hawks, you can't, it's illegal. Um, and even if you could, um, there's been a lot of work on ducks in, in particular. So they know that if they can pay trappers to go out there and trap, you know, discrete areas of the landscape, you know, like a, a mile section, they can increase or you know, they can increase nest success in that mile section. They're still not increasing that chick survival or the duckling survival, and so they're still not seeing overall population growth from that. So when you think read the literature, you see the studies that come out about you know nest predators and predator control. A lot of times they're only picking one particular stage where they can they can affect one stage, but they're you know there's other hurdles that that bird then has to pass through. Um, the only time it really has worked is if you look at in Europe on um, these hunting at big hunting estates, you know, they do a lot of actual like farm raised birds, you know, they do captive releases. Um, but, you know, that's where gamekeepers started and their job is to kill everything and they do. They kill jays, they kill a lot of things that are illegal here to kill again, like hawks and raptors and things that are also illegal to kill in those countries. And there's a whole lot of controversy around it. So I think that's another, you know, you have this, it's not always, it's not terribly effective. It's hard to be effective. It's really expensive and there's no guarantee it's gonna actually ever increase abundance. But then you have this other social side of, it that creates a lot of ill feelings towards hunting. Um, if folks want to, they can just go to the BBC website and look up the glorious 12th or August 12th. The articles around then, you're gonna find a dozen articles or more about how controversial you know, these shooting estates are because yeah, there's a lot of, you know, predator control going on on them. So I think that, you know, we're fortunate in this country, there's generally either ambivalence or support for hunting, and there's potentially a chance to um, adversely affect that attitude if we were to ever do something like that, which is sort of, but I think, you know, the biology side of it is sort of more, you know, convincing to me at least. It's probably not terribly effective. Yeah, those social components are, some of one of the things that we have to consider. And yeah. um, as you talked about the cost when we look at management, and um, I think that most managers would say the importance of habitat, quality habitat, you know, far outweighs anything else that we could do with other like predator control stuff. Yeah, um, I think that some of that duck work was trying to show again, they can increase nest success, but by the time you pass through that filter of duckling survival, you're paying 
a dozen or more dollars or you know for each individual duck you're producing and that's 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 in a relatively small area you're not doing it across a landscape you may be doing it on like a couple of wmas and you're so it's it is not cost effective yeah because you can't also think you can't do one year and then let it ride you have to do it every single year so it's just not it's not cost effective Ben, do you had a question or yeah john in the chat asked if you had any data on preferred egg crops for food corn versus sunflower or versus wheat or whatnot um so our answer is no we know there's different maybe well there are some studies that show at least among things like wheat corn whatnot corn might be the most calorically dense um but in terms of preference you know it probably depends on how easy it is to get access to. Um, we don't see birds foraging out in crop fields right after they're harvested. We might be out there for grit. They're maybe not getting as much grain because one, it's, there's not a whole lot of it anymore. Um, but we're seeing them spend a lot more time on with, with that over there. There's, there's no more overhead cover. So they're not going to say walk out into a exposed position to access that food unless they really absolutely need it. So they're able to make do with um, a lot of our the plants that are seeding on these sites, um, they certainly eat that eats uh, sunflower. Um, I think some of the crop studies maybe from them and I see some of them mentioned turkeys. They eat a lot of weed seeds too, so things like ragweed. Um, and it's probably just because it's more common on a lot of sites. You know, it's an annual weed. Um, they produce a lot of seeds too. So, but yeah, all that stuff um, during the growing season though they're eating they're all eating a lot of insects more so than seeds. Does that answer that question? I think yeah. So. My my family has a vineyard. I can tell you that turkeys, chickens, and uh, pheasants love grapes too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're Season opportunistic, the right? Yep. They're going to eat what they can find. That's, you know, they eat a lot. Uh, Jane had a question. How do you feel about releasing bread hens in the spring? I'm guessing she means for, you know, population, in, you know. Yeah. Um, it's not effective. Um, that's always been a thing, you know, a lot of times it's done in the fall for hunting, um, but even in the spring, anytime they've tried to do these propagations, they die so fast. Like, I think anyone who's maybe hunted on a put and take area, um, captive reared birds are pretty dumb. Um, you know, they show really different habitat use patterns um, than our, our surviving ones and like, there have been a lot of studies on yeah captive or translocated birds even and they just don't survive very well. um there's no then that's an addition to though so that's the reason why we don't do it um you know the dnr you know we said i said in the, earlier in the talk we used to have a um game releasing program but that stopped by the late 30s i think maybe the late 40s um and even back then people were like why aren't you continuing to do it it's, it's because that's the amount of birds you can raise you're not changing the bird numbers in the landscape. The landscape is what's driving these populations now. So once they got established, um, it's pretty, you know, it's it's nothing. It's not really um, helpful at all in terms of changing that population level. And I think now maybe this is a, a timely mention of it, but then there's also the risk for disease. Um, wild pheasants, actually, they do have some parasites and some diseases, but because they're at relatively low densities, they don't have the same issues that maybe captive reared birds do. So you know, that's why they spend a lot of money on, you know, anti-parasite drugs for, you know, these, at these game farms. Um, and even now you think about, um, you know, what happened, you know, the spring with, you know, avian influenza, um, it got into a lot, you know, there's a big story about a game farm in Wyoming. They had to um, destroy all the birds in that game farm because they tested positive for avian influenza. So can imagine maybe then you know releasing that into the landscape um what that might do so um yeah short answer is no it's not it's not effective and there's there's some potential downsides as well we have a couple more questions that have popped in um uh, bill wants to know are turkeys a problem for nesting success and he's thinking more on the unhatched eggs no um it always comes up uh by and large there's there's, they don't necessarily overlap as much as folks probably think they do. You can certainly see them in some of the same areas. 
uh, but areas where you're going to really find turkey populations, you're probably not finding too many pheasants for one. I know it comes up with rough grouse too. Um, it certainly occasionally happens, but I wouldn't say any more so than something like a deer. Um, you know, some of that camera work I mentioned maybe with songbirds, but it turns out deer eat a fair number of songbird nests, but there again, there's it's 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 infrequent when it happens, and there's nothing to say that another predator wouldn't come along and do the same thing. So in terms of like a, a population effect, no, there really isn't a whole whole big one at, at all, I would say. Uh, another question. Do groups of trees like a cedar groves produce enough benefits, especially in northern winter winters, to keep some when managing a prairie? We do see the Steve says we see the groves used heavily by pheasants. Yeah, no, um, they definitely will use them. Um, I think we talked about like you know winter cover. It's this question of use versus what's good for that population level. Um, you know, birds are trying to find that overhead cover. They're going to go wherever it is. Um, yeah, yeah, cedar stands are good for that. Like I said, in Illinois, the birds would hang out in the grassland with no trees and then move right into those tree lines during the day when there's deep snow. Um, I think you have to counter that with the, that impact, like you saw in some of that, those graphs from, the, from, from Nebraska. You tend to have fewer birds in those areas, and it's potentially because you're having adult predators like hawks hanging around, or you're providing habitat for things like raccoons, skunks, other critters that might then come onto your nesting habitat and eat those birds, uh, eat those nests. So, um, yeah, I don't doubt it's they, they they love it. They'll definitely use it. Um, the question is, does it have a population level benefit? And the answer is, you know, probably not. Um, I would. Like ninety percent certain, it probably doesn't isn't going to change much, you know. Uh, one more, one more time, uh, time for one more question. I think here, and it again relates back to grasses. And um, we talked about brome and reed canary grass are you know not really beneficial, but um, Jane mentions that some folks are love switchgrass. What are your thoughts about grasses? Um, native probably does tend to be better because that structure. The switchgrass um, is, is a native, right? It is, yeah. So that's yeah. there's that going for it. Um, I think anytime you're planting a monoculture, that's a bad, bad prospect. Um, I know our area managers talk about using big blue stem. That's a pretty aggressive one um, that can t quickly turn into a monoculture. But um, yeah, I think just diversity making sure it's the answer, right? Yeah, diversity. Yeah. So you you have your switchgrass, but that's great because it's also a nice, tall, dense standing one. But I think I've certainly seen monocultures that eventually die out or burn burn themselves out. Um, and then they turn to be pretty poor habitat, but yeah, switchgrass, Indian grass, a little bit of blue Forks. stem. Because the flower, the too. flowering plants are so yeah. important. Yeah, yeah, and that's the other key component. So, you know, goldenrod can be pretty aggressive too, but there's a lot of other things out there. Um, sunflowers, um, clo different clovers, things like that. Mm -hmm. Coneflowers. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, again, diversity, right? Moderation and diversity yeah. are the key. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So trying to maintain yeah. and, and manage that, your your, your populations. Uh, Benji, we had one good question. Maybe just remind folks that you can access these. We're recording them. Where can they find them? Yes, if you go to minnesotadnr.gov, search for um, outdoor skills, you'll come to our landing page there, and all the past recordings are there. They're usually up either end of the week, but always by Monday. So you'll be able to find the past recordings. So yeah, and you, and we should mention you do a lot of that heavy lifting on that. So thank you for your efforts on getting those up quickly. Well, we're out of time. Um, thank you very much, Tim, for joining us. It was really great to talk about pheasants, and uh, I hope folks get a chance to get out there and and check out our website again for more information on how to do that and um, what are some good tips and where to go. Uh, and then just a reminder: next week we have a talk. Um, you want to mention what we're covering next week? Yeah, we're going to uh, get updated on CWD. So deer season is coming in fast. So we're going to talk about CWD, all the things you need to know, updates on where where the zones are and what you need to do if you're harvesting deer there. So hope to see everybody next week. Yep. Take someone outside. Enjoy the fall. Thanks, Tim. Yes. Thanks for having me.